You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hey, David. And hello, listeners out there in the world. Welcome back to Common Descent Podcast. Episode 15. Woo! If you've been here since the beginning, that's awesome. Thanks for following us the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. Today's episode is kind of a follow-up episode. Yeah. Uh, Back in episode 5, for those of you that have been following us for a long time, we did an episode about the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Mm -hmm. The extinction that ended the age of the dinosaurs. Today, upon listener request, we are doing this episode about the end Triassic mass extinction. Yep. The extinction that started the age of the dinosaurs. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a cool one, and it's a lesser known of the the famous Big Five. Yeah, it's well, it, it, it's I think for a lot of people, you don't expect for another mass extinction to be within the Mesozoic. Like, you think of oh, yeah. the dinosaur mass extinction, but there was one just at the beginning of their reign as well. That's true. There was also, I mean, there have been several mass extinctions throughout the Mesozoic. Mm-hmm. There were two of the big five are there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, there's a, a pretty noticeable extinction, at least one at the end of the Jurassic, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, I mean, that, that goes with what we were saying earlier, is it's very common for the the geologic ages to be signified by some massive change and yes. if there's a massive change probably going to be a mass extinction and vice Many versa times. if there's a mass extinction you're going to notice a difference in the fossil record very true mm. but before we get into all that extinction talk yeah a couple of quick announcements that we want to make sure to make first and foremost it is now august mm-hmm. and so i thought this would be a good time to remind our listeners that the three episodes that we released over the course of July were brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. Yes, indeed. So big thanks to all those who support us on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our listeners. If Mm -hmm. you like the show and you want to see us continue to do this sort of thing, maybe even do more stuff in the future, hopefully, and you feel like supporting us in a financial sense, please consider joining us on Patreon. You can donate whatever you want for as long as you want, and patrons get some neat little bonus things like behind-the-scenes audio and, and extra little insights into what we do. You can get more direct contact with us, cool stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. The other thing is, we mentioned this last episode, so we won't talk too much about it, but the big... Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference is coming up at the end of the month, so if there's anything in particular that you want to know about the big paleo meeting, let us know and we'll see what we can do for you. Yeah, we can do specifics, we can do you know, interviews, we could do an overview of what paleo conferences are like, or what their purpose is, all that kind of stuff. So, whatever you're most curious about, let us know. Indeed. And now the news. Just like that. Will, would you like to kick it off? I would. Since I've been talking for the last, the the whole podcast, entire episode so far. Yeah. No, it's it's good to get a word in. Me yapping a lot. So so my, my news article actually has to do with a specimen that was the subject of one of our previous news articles. Another follow up. Yeah, so some of you may realize uh, just a few months earlier a press release about a particular dinosaur fossil found in Alberta, Canada. It was found in 2011, but recently published on and uh, announced. Mm -hmm. But it was an ankylosaur fossil that was the best preserved ankylosaur by far, but one of the best preserved dinosaur fossils ever found. Yeah, this was the one that looked like a gargoyle. Because it was preserved in 3D. It wasn't just... Yeah. We didn't just have skin in the, on this one. It was actually still in 3D. 
they mentioned in this article that you know you, you do most study on dinosaurs by looking at the bones. We can't actually see the bones here because the skin's in the way. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really awesome. Uh, so some recent research has been done. Uh, it's in Current Biology by Brown et al. And they were looking at the skin to try to learn a little bit about if we could see anything with the uh, coloration on this dinosaur. That's a common mm -hmm. thing to look at once you get skin. And they found uh, some potentially interesting results. So yeah. typically when you're looking at skin color, you look for uh, melanosomes, which are cellular, cellular structures that preserve pigment or the evidence of pigment yeah. and all that good stuff. And that's how we've done it with a lot of other dinosaurs and fossil animals that we've gotten preliminary color findings for. They weren't able to find those here. So they had to go a mm -hmm. step farther to see if they could find anything. And they looked for byproducts of pigment uh, degradation. Yes, as they break down. Yeah, the as pigments remnants break down, they leave behind things. And one of the things they found is, let's see, benzothiazoil. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Which is from the pigment phenomelanin. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Everyone's taking notes. Um, <laughs> no cap words. Now, this would be a reddish pigment that they would have had, which could suggest that it was a reddish brown color that the dinosaur was. Yeah. Now, it does get pointed out, I'll say this right now, that someone pointed out that the benzo can come from multiple sources. It can also come from oils as they break down and a couple of other minerals. Um, yeah. So it's not definite that this is pigment. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion around this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, whenever you're using secondary, secondary, you know, evidence, yeah. <laughs> it's, there's lots of potentials for error. But the cool thing, if this is from the pigment, mm -hmm. there is another finding that went with it that's really exciting. They found the pigment along the back, but not the belly. Or they found the byproduct along the back, yep. but not the belly, which would suggest countershading. Countershading. Yeah, it's it's this is this is one of our you know regular words we come back to. Countershading is a is a very simple form of camouflage where you're dark on your back and light on your belly. Mm -hmm. Motion going animals use it because if you look up, they blend in with the sunlight. If you look down, they blend in with the depths. Forest yep. going animals use it because when the sun's beating on your back, your belly is shaded and now your your back is lighted, which means you're roughly the same tone with yeah, those you, colors. You look less three-dimensional because mm -hmm. it, it obscures the shadow by making your back and belly appear the same tone even in sunlight. Yeah, it makes it seem like you don't have a shadow because now your shadow is the same color as your back. Yeah, so if you're a predator scanning the forest, this shape, you're not gonna, it's not going to jump out at you as yeah. much. It's going to be more two-dimensional in the background. And they found evidence of countershading in dinosaurs before. There's a little ceratopsian mm -hmm. that yep. had it. Cetacosaurus. Yeah. And the cool thing about this is it suggests a couple things, not necessarily about our dinosaur, but about its predators. Because one, this was a big ankylosaur. So if it had countershading, yeah. that means something was likely preying on it, even though it had armor. You know, so it still had active predators. But also, yeah. if countershading is this common in dinosaurs, it means that vision was very important for their predators. Indeed. That they were relying on vision very heavily to... Because it's not... Because they were saying in modern-day animals, it's mostly small animals that you see countershading on. You know, you don't see countershaded elephants. Yeah, yeah. But with a, if a big ankylosaur is also using it, then vision was really, really important back then to yeah. hide. And a big animal needed to hide. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it gives us... It, it potentially... Once again, this is if the pigment findings are correct... But if mm -hmm. that is, gives us some interesting insights into, you know, bits of the food chain and lifestyles of these animals. It's very cool stuff. This yeah. uh, uh, either this or a very similar study is actually being presented on at SVP. Oh, cool! Because it's in the abstract mm -hmm. list. Well, it's, I, my favorite thing about this is we all we knew something cool was going to come from a fossil this nice. It's neat that yep. it's within months. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, this is being like you said. It's been worked on mm -hmm. since. 2011, and this is the official paper. Uh, this paper not only reveals the color and stuff, it also names it. Yes. So this exciting dinosaur from back a few months ago now has a name. 
Yeah. Uh, it is Boreal Apelta. Mm-hmm. Mark, uh, Mark Mitchell, Mitchell I, right? <laughs> I you like, know? yeah. I love the, I love the species <laughs> name. Mark Mitchell I is a great name. Yeah. It's named for the guy who spent, if I remember from one of the articles, several thousand hours prepping it. Oh, wow. So you remember in the, um, in, in episode 13, we talked to Sean about prep work and he was mm-hmm. explaining that the Mastodon will be, you know, several months to, to a, a couple of years to prep. Well, this guy's been working on this one dinosaur since 2011. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, he earned that species name. Yep. Yep. Mark the Ankylosaur. <laughs> Very cool. All right. My first article is going back farther than that to it's the not, very early Triassic period. It's not a competition. Uh, <laughs> so I win. <laughs> <laughs> this is the discovery of an extremely early Triassic large fish. Mm-hmm. Now, if you are out there and you're one of those people who's biased towards tetrapods, a, a big fish might not sound exciting. Yeah. But... What makes this big fish exciting is its proximity to the Permian mass extinction. Yes. So, uh, we mentioned the big five mass extinctions before. Today we will be talking about one of them. The Permian mass extinction was the biggest one, as far as we can tell. And for a long time, it has been suspected that ecosystems and food webs around the world were pretty damaged by it for quite some time. Yeah. Specifically, in the early Triassic, for for several million years after the Permian extinction, tropical regions don't have many fossils of vertebrate animals, mm-hmm. particularly not fossils of big vertebrate animals. And so some have suggested that there was what they call an equatorial vertebrate eclipse, Ooh. which basically means... The food webs were broken in those regions, possibly because of temperatures, Mm -hmm. such that there were no large predators. Yeah. An interesting thought, which is not true, (laughs) now that we found this fish. (laughs) (laughs) So this is a fish named Bergeria americana. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's actually a number of Bergeria species throughout the, the this you know general time period. This fish was found in Nevada, which was in the tropics at this time as part of Pangaea. It dates to around 250 million years ago. Looks like it's about um, 1 million years after the extinction, which is pretty close. Yeah, that's that's a pretty short time frame. Yup. It's known from uh, partial skull material, and the partial skull material is almost a foot long. And the full animal is estimated to have been not quite two meters, yeah, or about six feet, which Big is fish. bigger than its older relatives, bigger than any of the things we're finding in that area at that time. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's got three rows of teeth. It's a, it's a, this is a, this is an interesting fish. But all the fish in this genus are active hunting predators. Yeah. So that's to say that there was a large, you know, person-sized predatory fish swimming around in the tropics about a million years after this mass extinction, which has interesting implications for how the ecosystems rebounded. Yeah. That this is an apex predator that was able to find a niche, find a foothold in a place where we weren't sure that apex predators could have survived. Yeah. Well, and it's and it's cool because it's not just an apex predator by like comparison to what was around, but like that size of fish. You know, we're talking big barracuda size. Oh yeah, that's a big fish. Like which are apex predators today in a you know fairly healthy ocean with other large animals. So like that's a it's a good sized predator regardless of what you're comparing it to. Yeah, which is cool. Uh, the same paper also reports the finds of a handful of other uh, potentially similar fish and a handful of other nearby localities. So it seems that the food webs were more intact at this time than we had suspected. Which is, it's interesting because that either means they rebounded quickly or they were not completely undone like we thought. So they yes. were still stable. 
Indeed. Which is they also make a, a quick note about the fact that, because it's been, I, I, there's been some discussion about just how hot the tropics were following mm-hmm. the end Permian, which was a hot time anyway. And they're saying that the presence of this big fish suggests that it wasn't too hot because fish today, they're similar fish today. Their eggs don't survive above a certain temperature. Oh, interesting. Uh, so they might be getting some evidences of, of temperature from this, uh, or at least some, some general guesses, which is cool. Very interesting. Cool. Indeed. Big old fish. Yeah. So I am not talking about big old fish from our next one, but in fact, bitty bitty baby fish. Super tiny fish. Itty bitty. So fish larva, which is something that a lot of people don't realize that fish do have a larval state. Mm -hmm. And so this is a modern study on modern fish. We're not actually talking about fossils. What? But this has to do with developmental and evolutionary aspects of genetics. So getting away from stuff we usually talk about, but it's cool because of what they found uh, is something you don't typically hear about having to do with genetics. So this is in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, is where you'd find this study. Um, And it was looking at these small cichlid fish, and when they're the larvae are still first developing, you know, after they've hatched, but before they're full-grown fish, they mm-hmm. noticed a, as they put it, vigorous gaping. Basically, they just had this, <laughs> they're constantly, just constantly opening and closing their mouth yeah. very fast. Like, like they have a little video on the the link, and it's just, they're sitting there constantly doing that. Yeah. In the video, they look like little... Pixar characters. Yes. Wah, 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 wah. Well, they look like or the uh, the uh, the sardines from SpongeBob. Meep, 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 meep. That is exactly what they look meep. like. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and they notice this, and it happens after the jaw muscles and cartilage has formed in their jaw, but before the bones have grown, before the the you know calcium has been deposited. All right. So they're like baby people where their their skull bones aren't quite finished coming together. Exactly. Yet. So their their skull is still forming and maturing and they mm-hmm. start this gaping during that process and they had the idea and hypothesis that this gaping might be affecting the way the bones are growing and even stimulate bone growth in certain ways depending on how they gape. Interesting. And this is partially because the gaping speed and frequency differs by species. So different fish were gaping at different rates. Now this is getting into a subject called epigenetics, which some people may have heard of. It became, you know, it started getting, it's been around since like the forties, but it's started getting more and more traction recently as people have been studying it more. Mm -hmm. And basically what this subject, the, the general definition of this subject is this is anything that influences your genetic expression without actually changing the genes. Yes. So the, the, the way that the title, cause I was super confused with the first time I read through this, cause yeah. I didn't get what they were trying to get at, mm-hmm. but they explained that these fish, what you see in, in these fish is differences in their gaping behavior and associated differences in their skull bones, despite not having related differences in the genetics. Exactly. And so this this affects a lot of things. And we've, we, like, I first started hearing about epigenetics back in undergrad. And it, Mm -hmm. when it started becoming a bigger thing, it basically was this big Pandora's box where people, basically what it is, is there are factors of the environment that can affect your development without causing mutations. Yeah. So your genes are the same. It's Mm -hmm. just what the genes are doing doing yes or how much they're being expressed or if they're being turned on and off there's lots yep. of different things uh you know there's narrower fields but they're focusing on that general definition of how does the environment influence developmental gene expression and developmental features mm-hmm. and the cool thing that they've found but this study showed is epigenetics has a huge effect bigger than you would typically expect so mm-hmm. the way they decided to test it is they went, they perform experiences to see if they could slow down fast gaping fish and speed up 
slow gaping fish to see how much that affected their eventual skull morphology when they became adults. So did it change right. the shapes of their skulls by changing those speeds? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely yeah. changed them. And the cool thing was, is so they've done genetic studies with these fish before. And they've been focusing mm -hmm. on the skull. And they said beforehand, when they manipulated the genetics, actually going in and changing the genes, mm -hmm. they saw up to about a 20% variability. Right. So the variability in the shape of the skull yes. bones. That the, the changing the genes could change the skull bones up to that amount. About 20% difference. Mm -hmm. And which is decent. You know, that's not yeah. a crazy amount, but it's decent. By just changing the gaping not doing anything with the genes, just changing the gaping, they saw about a 15% variability yeah. between the shapes. So almost the exact same amount as changing <laughs> your genetics. Yeah, so even with the genes being the, the mm -hmm. genes that code for the skull development, yep. not changing in their basic structure, these fish moving their mouths is changing how this is, is expressing. Absolutely, which means that your environment could affect your development almost as much as you being born with a mutation. Yeah, or in this case, <laughs> and what what really is interesting to me in this case is it's, you know, we often, you know, you talk about that like, oh, nature versus nurture yeah. and, and how your environment affects you. And for me, I always think about that in terms of like, oh, if you're exposed to pollutants or yeah. if you're, you know, if you're grown in a tiny box. But in this case... It's that the fish have an instinctual behavior mm -hmm. in response to environmental conditions. Yes. And that behavior is somehow communicating to the cells to change how they're using the genes. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's – and they were saying that's the next step is to figure out how are these bone cells sensing and responding to yeah. the environment and the – gaping behavior and they found that it's all expressing one gene the i think i think it would be pitch one but it's ptch mm -hmm. the pitch one gene is the the one being expressed but it's still having all these different effects and it's cool because not only does this mean your genetics don't have to change but this could actually be a new tool for evolution where Yes. Your body responding to the environment or your behavior responding to the environment and changing your gene expression would basically preset you up for natural selection to choose for this new form. Yeah, the idea that, you know, variation is where natural selection gets its material. Mm -hmm. Right? Some survive, some don't, and that hence the selection. We classically think of that as being you either have the genes that code for this beneficial trait or you have genes that code for a negative trait but this is saying that even with the same genes in the skull the variation is being provided by that behavioral mm -hmm. aspect so you're going to get selection acting on another thing on mm -hmm. that behavior on that response to the environment which will change how the animal looks and change how the animal behaves without actually changing the genes for the skull. Yes. And so yes. that could eventually, by changing, you know, so they described it as uh, having a lot of effect on like length of the jaw or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. By if you need longer jaws, so you gape the correct amount to give yourself longer jaws because of how your body reacts to your environment, whatever it is that's mm -hmm. doing that sensing. You now get longer jaws. Selection can now select for those longer jaws, which could lead to your genes being now eventually base programmed for longer jaws because you've yes. already been setting, you've already had that body shape. So that's already the advantage. It's really, yeah. epigenetics is super interesting because it's a whole comp as complicated layer now on top of the already genetic complicated layer yeah, hope of evolution and development. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot. We're learning a lot about how variation occurs, how mm -hmm. natural selection works with variation and works with genetics. Yeah. There's a whole lot. Genetics well, is overwhelming. Because well, a lot of people think that it's like if you have this gene, it creates this thing. And that's mm -hmm. not 
actually how it works. If you have that gene, no. it sets off a domino effect inside your body that will create certain things. But if that gene's turned on, or if that gene has another gene with it, or if that gene ha all these other factors <laughs> can completely change how that affects. And it's, yep. you know, the absence or presence of a certain chemical could activate a part of your genetics. Yeah. And it's worth, I, I think, a, a big sign of how we sort of misinterpret and misunderstand genetics in our basic understanding is I would bet money that a geneticist listening to this discussion would be twitching every time we talk about a gene doing something. Oh, yes, exactly. Because I... I don't think it really works quite that. It's not like this, because you can have a patch of DNA that contributes to several different mm -hmm. functions. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, or multiple sections that work together. It's not one gene, one function, which no. is sort of the, the classic idea. It's, yeah, well, it's, it's such a complicated, you know, we still have chunks of DNA that are junk data that we, as far as we can tell, isn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. Or, may have done something or may do something sometime like that we yeah. don't know why it's there still. Um uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's it's really, really complex. Um yeah. there are genes whose entire purpose is to control what other parts of the genome do. Yep. There are there are sections of the genome whose entire purpose is to not do anything. Mm hmm There are stop codons. Yep. Whose job is to say, okay, stop making proteins here. Yep. All right, you're done. Start later. Yep. It's, yeah. it's, it's like reading a tech manual. It's, it's like reading a manual book where a, you know, all the pages keep having that refer to page so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a choose your own adventure it's, tech manual. It's really interesting stuff. Hey, this isn't a genetics episode. No, it's not. And we are not geneticists, so I'm glad for that. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do some research before we get on that. We, this, this news article dipped into about the entirety of, of how much I can understand what it's, they're talking about. It's good stuff. I also have a piece about studying modern animals to understand evolutionary processes. Uh -huh. It is much less technical. This is a brief piece, although it, it is a, a study over a long term, about geckos in Brazil that evolved giant heads directly because of humans modifying the environment. So they wanted to become better sports mascots. Exactly. <laughs> and they walked around and they, they eat people on the field. <laughs> they are all excellent dancers. <laughs> so there is a group of geckos uh, of the genus Gymnodactylus, which are, Wikipedia says, also known as naked-toed geckos, uh, which must be true because it's on Wikipedia. Yeah. They eat termites. Uh, like I said, they live in Brazil. A while ago, this area of Brazil where they live was flooded uh, for for the use of, for for use with uh, hydroelectric dams, mm -hmm. and the flooding submerged some parts of the land and separated a bunch of others into little islands. Yeah. Now, back in episode four, we talked about crazy evolution happening on islands. Yep. What happened here is. Several species of termite-eating lizards went extinct on these little isolated island patches. Yeah. This particular species of Gymnodactylus, Gymnodactylus, Gymnodactylus amaralli, mm -hmm. stuck around. And over the course of just about 15 years, the lizards on the island evolved significantly larger heads and mouths compared to the lizards on the mainland. Mm-hmm. Which is cool for a few reasons. One, that's really fast. Yep. That's some fast adaptive evolution. Uh, the idea that the researchers are putting forth, and this is, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, a study in PNAS by De Amarim et al. They're putting forth this suggestion that with all the other termite eaters away, these lizards were selected for being able to catch a wide range of prey. Mm-hmm which favored having big heads with big mouths. Not big bodies, because big bodies take more energy to... You have to eat more food to fuel a big body. Yeah. So it would cancel out. Instead, they grew big heads. Yeah. You just need big, like, those grabber animal toys. Just big old... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they're, they're pretty... You know, they're, they're pretty confident in that 
adaptive function because both males and females showed this change. Mm -hmm. And this same change happened in five different populations on five different islands. That's cool. This wasn't like one freak weird genetic drift. This was what appears to be a very fast adaptive change to feeding ecology that was selected for separately across all these islands. That's really cool. Yeah, so it's... This is another, much like you were talking about genetics and how we're learning that, you know, it sort of defies our expectations. The la Especially recently, we've been seeing a lot of studies like this that are showing cases where you can have noticeable changes in appearance and behavior mm -hmm. and, and genetic shifts over a pretty short period of time. Yeah. Uh, we've seen things like this in lizards and birds and fish. And like you said, both in physical and behavior is cool stuff. I saw something just recently talking about the fact that uh, non-rattling rattlesnakes are being noticed more commonly because yes. when you rattle, you get shot by people in Texas and other places where they're no. found. If you don't rattle... You don't get you don't get killed. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, there there were two other studies that came out just this past couple weeks about similar things. There was a study from uh, I think this was Florida that examined how anoles were affected by the polar vortex oh. event in the winter of 2013 2014. They found that anoles since that event are more cold tolerant. <laughs> that that single event selected for the lizards that were more cold tolerant because the ones that weren't cold tolerant didn't survive. Yeah, it did, it did that a, event. a a mini mass extinction of. Yep. So that one winter wow. has changed the population structure of anoles down in Florida. That's really interesting. There was another study that that looked at bacteria and put them in anti gravity chambers. Mm hmm. And found that they will evolve several new features to handle living in anti-gravity. And then keep some of them if they move back into normal gravity. That's how, that's how sci-fi movies get started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Andromeda strain. Yep. So yeah, there's all these cool studies are showing us that evolutionary processes are not limited to long-term gradual shifts. That you can have pretty rapid, pretty short-term adjustments as well. And this one's super cool because it is in direct response to humans modifying the environment. Absolutely. I think one of my favorites I ever heard, uh, because it's not just them reacting to us modification, but actually reacting to us, much like the snakes, mm -hmm. was there's these um, you know, cliff nesting birds that, uh, or you know, similar to that, that like to nest under bridges. You know, they like that mm -hmm. kind of cave cliff wall feel where they'll build their nests either on the side or within the crevices of those bridges uh, over roadways. And there was a, I can't remember which college it was nearest to, but they were studying the birds. They'd been collecting them and anytime birds were hit by the cars, they'd collect them off the side of the roads and they'd do all the just general measurements, which include wingspan and stuff like that. And at some point, one of them realized that with the ones they were catching and the ones they were finding they were noticing a difference in wingspan and that the hmm. live caught birds were over the you know record of the data were getting shorter and shorter wings and the ones being hit by cars had typically longer wings uh interesting but the cool is that they were finding less birds on the side of the road over time that's cool so, the so birds it's selecting were, for the birds that are able to avoid the cars. more maneuverable, shorter wings, which yep. we see in forest dwelling birds all the time, so that they could dodge the cars quicker, make tighter turns, were being that's, selected for, and they were seeing it within one single study. That's cool. It's really interesting stuff. We we you know we don't think about it, but nature can actually adjust pretty quickly at times. Yeah, and that's it's another thing that. You know, we often talk about evolution as a thing that happened, mm -hmm. but it's it happens. It it is always happening right now. Speaking of evolution, let's talk about extinction. Absolutely. So the, this this is the one thing that puts a halt to a lot of a lot of animals' <laughs> evolution. Indeed. So two days. 
topic, the end Triassic extinction event. This is a topic that was requested not by one listener, but by two listeners. After we did the KPG mass extinction episode back in episode five, uh, both Thomas and Mark on Twitter suggested that we do this episode as well. So thank you to Thomas and Mark for making the suggestion. Indeed. We hope we do you proud. So, real quick, before we talk about this big extinction event, let's review mass extinction. So, we talked about this in episode 5 a bunch. Extinction is not a rare occurrence. In fact, extinction happens constantly. Mass extinctions are also not really that rare. There's uh, a lot of times over the course of history where something will happen and you'll have a, a... big pulse of extinction, either in one specific area or across the globe. And then, of course, there are a handful of instances where you have extinction on such a dramatic scale that it shows up all over the planet Mm -hmm. in the fossil record and seems to wipe out a really significant portion of life. Yeah. Classically, we, we refer to five of these, the big five. Mm -hmm. of which the end Triassic extinction is number four. Sweet. So, the Triassic period. Yeah. Let's set the stage. The Triassic period starts at about 250 million years ago, Mm -hmm. in the wake of the Permian mass extinction, the third of the Big Five. Yep. It is the first period of the Age of Reptiles, and it shows by what we find in the Triassic period fossil record. Mm Mm-hmm. So uh, at this time, right, we're, we're between 250 and 200 million years ago. All the continents are together in Pangaea. Uh, and we'll put a, I'll put a link up on the blog post so you can see. Uh, at, this, at this time in the Triassic, Pangaea kind of formed this big C shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, the Tethys Sea forming uh, off to one side. Life on Pangaea had dramatically changed, right? So the Permian extinction had changed what was around. So the world had recently lost trilobites. Bummer. It had recently lost horn corals. Mm-hmm. Uh, we lost a bunch of, you know, uh, a bunch of sort of the, those old, cool, uh, ancient mammal relatives like the Gorgonopsids and things like that. Yeah, exactly, which were dominating the land surface yep. during their time. So the Triassic is a, pl- is a time where life is sort of retaking the, the landscape. In the sea, we've got a whole, you know, abundances of of a lot of familiar creatures, bivalves, brachiopods, Mm -hmm. uh, aminoids are are doing quite well. Modern types of corals, so scleractinian corals, uh, not the same as the kind of corals you got mostly throughout the Paleozoic. Mm -hmm. And then on land, you know, you have a lot of holdover, you know, things that have been around for a while, like the temnospondyls, which were the big archaic amphibians. Oh, which were so... They are very cool. But you also get a bunch of new radiations. Mm -hmm. This is the time where nature went, hey, this reptile thing's kind of cool. Yep. Uh, Or particularly this amniote thing is kind of cool, as we'll see. Eggs with shells are a kind of good idea. Yeah, this is working out great. We see lots of different groups of early reptile experiments. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just all sorts of really bizarre... Shapes and sizes of reptiles, which do include, uh, especially in the late Triassic, the first turtles, yeah, the first lizards, uh, the first pterosaurs, rel- uh, the, the earliest representatives of lineages like frogs and salamanders, which are not reptiles, but they're also there. But there are typically three big groups that you hear about uh, dominating the Triassic landscape. You have your therapsids. Yep which are your mammal ancestors and cousins, things like dicynodonts and cynodonts. Uh, The first mammals do officially show up by the end of the Triassic as well. These, you know, came in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They were a pretty significant portion of the terrestrial ecosystem. You also have the dinosauriforms. Hey, I heard of those. Yeah, so that includes not just the first dinosaurs, like you had Coelophysis and Platyosaurus and things like that, Mm -hmm. but also a lot of not quite dinosaur things like the Silosaurids and uh, you know basically all the cousins of the dinosaurs that you haven't heard of because they didn't make it much past this. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. I'll, but perhaps most excitingly, the even even for me, <laughs> the pseudosuchians, yeah. or the crocodile line reptiles, were insane in the Triassic. Yeah. True crocs hadn't shown up yet. Like, proper crocodilians aren't around, but their ancestors are. Mm-hmm. Alongside things like the armored edosaurs, the terrestrial predatory rawasukians, mm-hmm. weird slender-bodied terrestrial croc ancestor slash relatives mm-hmm. and things that acted a lot like crocs but weren't crocs yet. Lots there were of... also a, a handful of things that weren't even in this group that acted a lot like crocs, like mm-hmm. phytosaurs. Yep. <laughs> yep. All sorts of really diverse, really fascinating groups of reptiles across the land. And there's actually been a number of things that have pointed to this time period as being an anomaly, not because of how weird the animals are, but because of how many really big predators. Yeah. Like, it was a surprisingly dense predator environment. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a few things. I don't know how much this stands up still today, but I've seen a few things suggesting that we may have been seeing a, a food chain that was more heavily predators feeding on predators Interesting. Then. I know there's evidence because phytosaurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's evidence of phytosaurs feeding on rawasukians. Exactly. Like we've seen evidence of yep. the predators, and so this may have been a thing where, yes, there were herbivores and other animals being eaten, but the predators were hunting each other almost as much as they were hunting other yeah. stuff, which makes it like the island from Peter Jackson's King Kong, <laughs> 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 where it's everything's it just does. eating everyone constantly, and everyone's hungry. <laughs> oh man. The other big takeaway here is that this was not, right, this was the age of reptiles, but it was not the age of dinosaurs. No, not really. You had the, all these crazy crocodilomorph cousins. You had early dinosaurs and their cousins. You had therapsids, right, mammal mm-hmm. ancestral and ancestors and ancestral cousins, all sort of scattered across the landscape, sharing the landscape with each other. Uh, marine reptiles were very similar. There were something like a dozen different lineages of reptiles that took to the sea and became fairly diverse and fairly successful as marine, including the first ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. Yeah, it's so it's this, really cool how much reptiles just exploded from that point. Yeah, this was a major radiation uh, of reptiliform creatures. Uh, and synapses, you know, we, we keep saying reptiles and it yeah this was the age of reptiles but you know that the mammal lineage groups were also doing quite well in the triassic as well very cool yeah it's it's a cool time because you think about them as just being for dinosaurs but <clears throat> during these beginning times the biggest predators on land and the biggest herbivores on land were not actually part of that lineage they were you know, these other reptile groups, cousins mm-hmm. of the crocodilian lineage, like Postosuchus was one of the yeah. the biggest at that time, which was a big four-legged terrestrial predator. We had a lot of really big, weird reptilian herbivores yeah. you know, that you don't see afterward. It was a cool time. You also got weird little things, like the drapanosaurs and the, the gliding... Yeah. Like, like Charavipteryx. I did these very strange early creatures. And then it ended. Bummer. <laughs> at, so the Triassic period comes to an end at about 200 million years ago with the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. Mm-hmm. As was the case with the KPG the, and Cretaceous mass extinction, we knew about this extinction long before we knew about what might have caused it or anything like that. Yes. This, you look through the fossil record and there's this very clear transition between we've got a lot of this stuff up here and we don't have any of it, you know, up a layer mm-hmm. or two. Something shifted. A lot of times when you find big events, it, it, it seems like, you know, you, you eventually make your way to figuring out there was a mass extinction. But you have, it's more like a crime scene in that. You find the body first, and then you figure out what killed them, uh, and in which room, and in which device, and, you know, 
and you win Clue. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get into, you know, causes and, and what was going on at the time, let's talk about what we lost. Mm -hmm. Who was around and who wasn't around afterwards. This is a mass extinction. So I, I fear that we started with the end Cretaceous extinction and spoiled everybody. Mm -hmm. Because we know way more about the Cretaceous mass extinction than we know about any of the other big five. Yeah. It's also by far the most popular, so it gets discussed more frequently. And yep. It's also the youngest, so there's mm -hmm. more evidence that we can still access. Uh, this is not... So so I, we, we don't have nearly as much details about this extinction, yes. a, as you'll see, as we do for the end Cretaceous. There's a lot of uncertainty in exactly what was going on. I'm not going to cite a percentage of life that went extinct because that's almost impossible to find because that's almost impossible to know. Yeah. Uh, even for the end Cretaceous. You have to know what the total was to get a percentage. Yes, uh. and we don't. We <laughs> definitely don't know what the total was. <laughs> but suffice it to say, many, many families, I, I, at least 100 f known families of animals disappeared at this boundary. Not species, not genera, families of animals. Yeah accounting for a significant percentage. So starting in the sea, uh, I found a, a few different estimates of the extinction percentage of known marine genera. Mm -hmm. And it the you know the estimates I found range from 30 to 50 percent yeah. of genera. So species would have been higher than that. We see major losses and replacements in nanoplankton, uh, things like famous foraminifera, we see, you know, many families disappear of sponges and bivalves and gastropods yeah. and brachiopods. Uh, corals lose uh, the possibly more than 30 families wow. of corals. They, there were big reefs back in the Triassic that a lot of those species uh, disappeared. Cephalopods, many, many families of cephalopods disappear, including lots of the aminoids which will later stick around to become famous in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. Fit, you know, plenty of fish go extinct. Also, a lot of those marine reptiles that I mentioned before. So uh, we mentioned that, you know, during this sort of diversification of reptiles, a bunch of different lineages made it into the ocean to become fully marine. Well, almost all of those go away at this extinction boundary. Yeah leaving the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs to go become the famous ones yep. throughout the rest of the Mesozoic. Uh, they, they originally were joined by a bunch of others that just did not make it. Uh, before we leave the ocean, one other note, and it's a poignant note for geologists and, and invertebrate paleontologists, the Triassic-Jurassic extinction is the final stand of the conodonts. Mm. So... Conodonts are these super famous fossils that are exceptionally good for index dating. They show up at the Cambrian explosion, and they are a favorite of sedimentologists and geologists and people trying to sort out biostratigraphy mm -hmm. for 300 million years. Yeah. They survived the Ordovician extinction, the Devonian extinction, and the Permian extinction. And this is finally the one... That takes them out. They were little, sort of almost like hagfish. Very, very archaic uh, vertebrates uh, who are famous for their teeth. The little toothy structures that we tend to find of them. It, it, their, their pictures are hilarious looking and horrifying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll put some up there. Uh, but that's a little note. Conodonts are one of those things that most people probably don't know what they are and have never heard of them. Mm -hmm. But for people in the field, that's... It's a tough loss. Goodbye, conodonts. It's always one of those things where, like, as scientists, we know things go extinct, but mm -hmm. it is still, you know, not even bittersweet. It is still, you know, re you know, really kind of tragic when you see in the fossil record something that's been going on for so long, you know, for longer than yeah. mammals have been around. Yeah, hope. And then go extinct because it's, you know, it raises the questions of what was it that finally did you in that didn't on the other mass <laughs> extinctions, you know, yeah. what would you have been like, you know, what, you know, were you pushed? Yeah. You know, it's just like, there's so many questions and it's, it's such a, you know, it's such an odd thing, you know, something yeah. that was just, you know, cause we do, we have things that are still around from the Cambrian 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you root for him. Yeah, exactly. Like, hey, like, you made it this far. Keep going, little guys. Yeah, you don't expect it. You know, it, you you if you were able to if you were a celestial being and you were watching, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you were uh on that scale and you were watching the ev- evolution of a planet, every time you saw a big climactic change coming up, you betted with all the uh, celestial beings on what was going to go extinct. These would have been the one of the ones <laughs> that had been considered a safe bet. Yeah, conodons and trilobites. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden they just disappear, and then <laughs> you know you lose it big. It's that's what it always feels like when you're looking at the fossil record. You're like, wow, really? Jeez. Yep. Or because you know it's going to happen eventually. Yes. You say, oh, fi- time finally caught up with you. And yeah, and that's the flip side. Is then there's also the whole idea of the, the fact that bivalves are still around. Yeah. You know, it's like oh, you, even, you know, the the fact that nothing has taken you down is really impressive. Indeed. Up on land, lots of transitions in plants and pollen and spores. You know, you see big changes in there. In a lot of the cases, we the extinction boundary is marked by changes in either plant fossils or plankton in the marine realm. So lots of plants uh, disappear. There is reportedly a fern spike at this time. Uh, which we also see at the end Cretaceous. Yeah. Ferns do great when there's lots of death. Yep. So you tend to see fern and fungal spikes. Tons of insects go extinct. And then those tetrapods, all the reptiles and the the synapsids, the, ther- the therapsid uh, mammal creatures, basically anything that we named earlier that you haven't heard of went extinct. Yep. Everything that was dinosauriform that wasn't dinosaurs, and also lots of dinosaurs, <laughs> went extinct. Just about all of those cool croc creatures. Yep. The Phytosaurs, the Edosaurs, the Rawasukians, all none of them make it past this boundary. Uh, a few croc, uh, you know, croc family lineages do. Yeah. Like uh, and a... go on to, to do pretty well, actually, through the rest of the Mesozoic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but nowhere near as diverse. Yeah. Same thing with the Therapsids. Uh, Dicynodonts, I believe, don't make it through this this boundary, mm-hmm. and even some of the groups that do, you know, they're around for a little bit. They ultimately don't go, uh, except of course for the mammals. They they do all right. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. eventually they take their sweet time. <laughs> but what happens in the aftermath of all this is all this that that crazy diversity, those those different groups that were sharing the the spotlight on the land, have disappeared or been diminished, and much like how in the ocean all those cool marine reptile lineages are gone, leaving just the two that went on to become famous through the the rest of the Mesozoic, all that empty niche space, or at least most of it, is taken over by the dinosaurs. Yeah. This is the event that seems to have allowed the dinosaurs to gain the foothold they needed to dominate for the subsequent 160 or so million years of the Mesozoic era. Which is, it's a, it's cool patterns that you see with mass extinctions like this, because, you know, at the beginning of the Triassic, there was a mass extinction, and reptiles, in general, diversified. Mm-hmm. And took out, took over a lot of those new places, and then there was another mass extinction that killed off many of those, and now a group of reptiles that was able to survive, the the groups that were able to survive, then yep. diversified. And that's basically what happens with mass extinction after mass extinction. You know, even smaller ones, you know, localized, is whatever is able to survive now can just go on to kick butt, usually. Sometimes they don't yeah. rebound and they peter out, but if you're able to survive, the dinner table is now clear. Yes, much like those lizards mm-hmm. in Brazil we were talking about, how several species disappeared, and so the one that was still around changed to take advantage of all of this abundance exactly and so it's that's basically what you see and as time goes on the groups you know the the ones that we what we have today are the survivors of all of these extinctions yes (laughs) and that's the really the way to think about it and so that's it's you're constantly narrowing and then spreading and then narrowing and then spreading yeah and so our lineage has made it through innumerable bottlenecks it's that and it's really interesting when you look at it that way because yeah earth history is a gauntlet yeah that's and that's exactly it's like a uh you know a, a tournament 
Yes. You made it through the dif- the different tiers. Mm-hmm. So, dear listener, your ancestry, your ancestral history has made it through dozens of enormous mass mm-hmm. extinction events and environmental adversity. You should be proud. Absolutely. What have you accomplished today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Keep listening. It's like those. It's like we're gonna be that relative that always compares you to your grandfather. Or your, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know who wouldn't have who wouldn't have failed at doing that? Cynodonts. Yes. Let me tell you about Cynodonts back in the Triassic. You know who understand the true meaning of a hard day's work? <laughs> <laughs> Australopithecus. <laughs> so, uh, one of the big difficulties in trying to suss out this extinction event is that there are very few sequences on land Mm -hmm. that give you the layers that go across this boundary. Yeah. Uh, There are some in, particularly northeastern North America. Uh, The Newark Supergroup is a very, very famous uh, sequence of geology up in New England with uh, Triassic Age rocks, Mm -hmm. late Triassic. Uh, Greenland has some. But, you know, it's it's rare to even find the evidence of this boundary. So there's a lot of discussion and debate over exactly how this extinction happened. We mm-hmm. know it happened because things are there, then they're not. There has been there have been a number of studies that have suggested that there were multiple pulses of extinction. Yeah. That this wasn't one event, but that over many millions of years, there were a few discrete bursts. Uh, not every study finds this, though. So there is some debate over that. Yeah. There are some studies that find evidence of long-term decline. So I, I found studies citing that, that the late Triassic, the very late Triassic was just a time with a high extinction rate, not necessarily a single cat- catastrophic thing, but just in general, lots of things were going extinct and not very many things were originating. Yeah, just things kept dying off. Yeah, and not being replaced. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's evidence for in, in some fossil sites or, or fossil sequences that show certain groups of life possibly in decline for hundreds of thousands of years. Interesting. Uh, and then, of course, there are people that have suggested that it might be both, that there was long-term decline hit with a handful of discrete events. Yeah. So it's it, – we're really – there. there's a lot of discussion around exactly how the timing and sequence and pattern of this – series of extinctions and that's something that uh often doesn't get talked about because it's mass extinctions are typically treated like a guillotine you know hit yep. that boom. just boom cuts it separates those time periods now with one massive death blow because yep. once again what we typically think of is the end cretaceous extinction the asteroid impact which is as Good a metaphor for the guillotine coming down as yeah. you'll ever get in the natural <laughs> world. Uh, of course, if you listen to episode five, you know that even that example is not a good example of that. Exactly. But the the interesting thing when it comes to mass extinctions is that there's not a time limit on nope. how fast it has to happen. Like We don't have a regulation for like, oh, if it takes more than 20 million years, it doesn't really qualify. <laughs> you know, it's... If there, if everything seems to just be dying off, that's a mass extinction. Really, regardless of how much time it happens, like it needs to be within a a a, a barrier that you can see it happening, yeah. you know, as a change. But it, if it takes millions of years or thousands of years, it you know doesn't yeah. factor in. Yeah. So, you know, and and that brings up the issue, and we talked about this a little bit in both episode five with the KPG mm-hmm. extinction. But also in episode 12 with our geologic time scale, you know, we're really good at dating things in the past. Yeah. And we have great, you know, we, we have great accuracy. But when you're trying to date something 200 million years old, great accuracy means to within a million or a million years or so. Exactly. So it, it could be happening all across that time variation or in one specific moment of that. And it's, yep. there's really no way for us to get more precise. Yeah, at least not yet. Maybe in the future. Who we knows? keep getting better. Once I get that time machine, Morty. 
So speaking of sussing out the events, let's talk about the explanations. So we know we have this extinction. We know who went extinct. We, we have a general idea of, of what, you know, the after effects mm -hmm. of the extinction in terms of broad ecology are. Why did it happen? Much like the KPG, the end Cretaceous extinction, we're not grasping at straws. Uh, there's this, again, there's this, this tendency to portray mass extinction because it makes catchy headlines. Yeah. And catchy when you're talking to elementary school kids of what, uh, it's a grand mystery, what caused this extinction? And while it's true we don't know for sure, we do have excellent evidence of what big things were happening at the time. Yeah. it's We're not sitting in a room just going, this could kill them too. <laughs> so what if it was aliens? Yes. No, no, those, so, they, they build pyramids. <laughs> <laughs> for grain storage. <laughs> so at the end of the Triassic, we have, uh, before we get into any of the big major stuff, there's a lot of evidence for significant environmental shifts. Uh, the very end of the Triassic is a time of very high temperatures, mm -hmm. warm waters, high carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, possibly related to these, there's also evidence of widespread low oxygen in the waters and high sulfide during this, the, the very end of the Cretaceous. There's evidence that the nitrogen cycle was disturbed. There's evidence that uh, the oceans were being acidified that they had lower pH, which is bad news for things like corals. Mm -hmm. So there's there, there's there's uh, there's the potential that ocean circulation was disrupted. Uh, this happens a lot. So when you get high CO2 and high temperatures, you know, CO2 can acidify the water. Mm -hmm. High temperatures, you know, oxygen doesn't dissolve as well in warm waters. Yep. Uh, ocean circulation doesn't flow as well when the poles in the tropics aren't as different from each other. Yeah. There's not as much of a gradient. Yeah, it's you need uh it's, it's you know the whole thing with uh wind on the shores, you need hot and cold for energy to be transferred. The energy's yeah. uniform, why does it need to move? So if something you know, if you've had these big climatic shifts, they can cause things like low oxygen in the waters or uh a disrupted you know, lowered pH, things like that. So we've got all this stuff going on. We have evidence of, of major environmental effects. What's causing all this? Well, the general discussion around the end Triassic extinction revolves around three major suggestions, three major events that were happening at the time, and they are, stop me if you've heard this one before, <laughs> massive volcanic activity, Mm-hmm. Asteroid impact, all right, and sea level change. All right, yeah. So, we're we are still talking about earlier in the Mesozoic. <laughs> <laughs> and if you listen to episode five, as Will is alluding to, these are exactly the same three effects that were occurring, possibly related to the extinction around the end of the Cretaceous. Yep. Uh, which kind of raises the question for me. You, you know, that seems surprising, but then at the same time, how many ways are there to create a global mass extinction uh, you, really you uh put anti-gravity things on a city and then you bring the city up <laughs> and then, <laughs> then you drop it Boom. before the avengers can stop you well then why did it wait a minute <laughs> you listen sir you're mixing your you're mixing your references there no that's what he did he put the gravity things the the on the on uh, uh i don't remember the name of the city <laughs> in which one ultron Oh, see, I thought you were talking about Man of Steel. No, that's why I was making the yeah, I was noises. Right. Yeah, no, he did I was that talking about Steel. him dropping the city because that's because he wanted to do a extinction oh, level event. Your reference was better. <laughs> so let's work our way through some of the evidence for these events: volcanism, asteroid impact, sea level change. Starting with what seems to be the most popular answer, which is volcanic activity. Yes. In the End Cretaceous Extinction episode, we talked about the Deccan Traps, which were, was this major, major, major area of volcanic activity. A large igneous province. And what a large igneous province means is an area of ridiculous amounts of igneous rock mm -hmm. left behind by ridiculous amounts of lava. Yes. At the End Cretaceous, 
uh, the, 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 this sort of bound or the very latest Cretaceous coincides with one of the largest large igneous provinces in Earth history. It is called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or CAMP. Nice. It extended along a 6,000 mile long sequence of rift zones cutting through Pangaea. Wow. This rift, which, you know, the area where the continent was splitting, mm -hmm. would eventually become the Atlantic Ocean Cool. At this time, it was a volcanically active area of spreading crust. Mm -hmm. The volcanic rock left behind by this covers millions of square kilometers across North America, South America, Africa, and Europe. It's estimated that there were a few million cubic kilometers of lava erupted <laughs> over the course of this event. There is evidence that this volcanism extended, much like the Deccan Traps, for several hundred thousand years, possibly with multiple pulses of, you know, more major volcanic activity, you know, throughout that time. This was a lot of volcanic activity. I, this I had to say, really quick, I had to say my favorite phrase you used during that was cubic kilometer. Cubic kilometers. That means millions a, of cubic kilometers. That means a cube, people. That's a kilometer on all sides. <laughs> millions <laughs> this is, of those. This is like a Borg cube. This was extensive volcanism that continued for longer than humans have been around. Uh, all of this is also true of the Deccan Traps, but the mm -hmm. Deccan Traps were sort of more localized. What kind of effects might this have? All of this means that for thousands of years, uh, volcanic activity was releasing things like sulfuric gases, which mm -hmm. can uh, not only cause things like acid rain, but block sunlight. Carbon dioxide, which as we know, uh, tends to create a greenhouse effect, and also things like ocean acidification. Other gases, you know, methane, things like that. So this could easily be the the cause of rising temperatures mm -hmm. and sulfidification of the water, which we know happened at that time as well. Lower pH, lower oxygen in the waters, like that. It would not be a surprise for this to have caused all of those things. Mm -hmm. And indeed, a number of studies have found that this seems to line up with the extinction, except for the studies that find that it doesn't. <laughs> and back to in uncertainty. Some studies say that this lines up perfectly with the extinction. Other studies have done dates that say this actually starts after the extinction. Oh, interesting. Uh, I've seen at least one study that suggests that maybe the volcanism is responsible for later extinction events. Mm -hmm. That right, if this was indeed multiple extinction events, this once that this was Onue 2016, I believe, if that's how I pronounce that name, I apologize to whoever that is, was basically suggest the the source that I found suggesting that maybe this was early, you know, the first pulses were something else, but this yeah is what was causing the later ones, and then there was a study earlier this year in Nature that found that. The, the the first eruptions happen a good hundred thousand years after the first signs of extinction, but that the first evidence of underground magma movement coincide with the first evidences of extinction. Interesting. So that for a hundred thousand years or so, before the big eruptions actually started, you had all this magma activity, which may have already have been releasing volcanic gases and things like that, so that it could still be the cause, even though the eruptions didn't happen until later. Lots of discussion around this one. I say lava monsters. Lava monsters. And like the, the Titan at the end of Hercules. Exactly, like that. And, and they, were, him. they were coming up. But then it wasn't working, so they finally had to do their doomsday device and erupt all the volcanoes. <laughs> well, they were doing guerrilla warfare for yeah, exactly. 100,000 like, years. They were just coming up, and then finally they decided, all right, the surface will be ours. And <laughs> you know, This was the big climactic scene, and this movie ended like Empire Strikes Back. Good Nights did not win. Nope. 
did not win. I was going to say that this would be the equivalent to War for the Planet of the Apes. Yes. <laughs> it's the third installment where it all comes to a head. Yes, exactly. Speaking of space, he says, delicately segueing into the next <laughs> section. The other thing that has been suggested as the sort of catastrophic event is asteroid impact. Now, this, there is evidence for this, much like with the KPG, sediments around the world, in Japan and across Europe, for example, show, coinciding with the extinctions, spikes, you had a sudden increase in iridium and other elements that you tend to see in asteroid dust. Yeah. Microspherules and shocked quartz, which are structures that are formed during impact other chemical traces. These are also interesting because they seem to line up with a crater in Quebec, in Canada, called the Manicougan Crater, which some studies find matches up dates-wise with those evidences of asteroid impact. Interesting. And which some studies find also lines up with the extinction events. Interesting. The crater is... Uh, about 100 kilometers in diameter. So similar, you know, uh, pretty similar in size to the, the Chicxulub at the end of the Cretaceous. It's estimated, that, you know, I found citations that estimate it to be maybe half the size of the Cretaceous asteroid uh, or close to the size of the Cretaceous asteroid. So that seems pretty promising, but... Number one, again, there is lots mm -hmm. of questioning about the timing. Uh, a number of, of places argue that the dating doesn't line up and the, the, the crater is actually too early for the, the extinction event to be linked to it. Uh, others have pointed out that the actual evidence mm -hmm. of the asteroid impact, yeah, some of the evidence is like the, the chemical evidence that do seem to line up with extinctions might not be asteroid effects and that the, the 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 evidence is a little bit shaky but then again others find that it lines up perfectly with at least certain pulses of extinction so again there's issues trying to date things precisely enough to line up this specific event which happened right there's a crater obviously with turnovers and shifts in plant communities and plankton communities and things like that. If this did happen, uh, if yeah. this was related to the extinction, rather, perhaps the effects would have been very similar to the volcanic effects, right? Lots of junk up into the atmosphere, which can affect not only the climate, but also uh, the o ocean, right? Temperatures, chemistry, things like that. Uh, at the end of the Cretaceous, mm -hmm. the asteroid is often cited as causing a collapse of photosynthesis. Dust blocks out the sun, plankton, you know, uh, uh, photo, phyto, phytoplankton, phytoplankton, and cyanobacteria and plants struggle. You pull the rug out from the bottom of your ecosystem, mm -hmm. your trophic chain, and everything falls apart. So again, it certainly could explain these effects we're seeing, but whether or not it lines up is uncertain. Yes. It's interesting stuff because an another question that we have to obviously ask when looking at these things, and that I'm sure the researchers have, have asked many a times, is how close does an event need to be to the extinction to be linked? You yes. Know, how, how early is too early? You know, how mm -hmm. long does it take for some things to take effect? You know, would all no. things have immediate effects, or would it be a thing that set off a series of events that eventually, some may say an unfortunate series of events, but that may eventually <laughs> <laughs> cause a mass extinction? It's interesting. Yep. And and it's complicated by, again, the, the idea that there are multiple mm -hmm. potential extinction pulses and extended periods of volcanic activity. Uh, we mentioned this as well in the KPG episode, but in in l the context of the Triassic extinction, it has also been brought up, the idea that there could be a relationship between the asteroid impact and the volcanic activity, mm -hmm. that a major impact like that could potentially create changes in volcanic processes. Yeah. 
as with the Cretaceous episode, I want to stress that, as far as I'm aware, there's no actual evidence for that. Yes. But it's certainly an interesting enough thought to look into it. Yeah, it's it's you punch the earth hard enough, and it breaks. Yeah, it could cause. Yeah, you're sending <laughs> massive tremors through the ground, and that's gonna do new, who knows what. It's one of those where that's one of those thoughts that, like you said, I've never heard of any actual research to propose that. You know, that that actually supported and found evidence for that. Mm-hmm. But it's it's one of those. It makes seemingly obvious sense yeah but then often things that makes too obvious sense are probably simplifying something so it's one of those where it's like that was definitely when we first talked about kpg first thing that came to my mind (laughs) you know when i first you know the the first times i heard about those two things happening next to each other is like makes sense if you you know that's how earthquakes happen in the earth is something shifts and causes a massive release of energy yep. and triggers an earthquake, why not could that not shift magma flow or blah, blah, blah. But And as, as we discussed in the Cretaceous episode, we have evidence that earthquakes can do that. Mm-hmm. And we have evidence that at the time of the Cretaceous extinction, there does appear to have been a major shift in the activity of the volcanic province. Mm-hmm. But whether or not those two evidences are linked at all is uncertain. Yeah. And in the case of the Triassic extinction, as far as I'm aware, the only evidence supporting it is, well, that, they, you know, it's been suggested for the Cretaceous. Yes. With enough evidence that it's interesting to look into. Yeah. It's it's not something just to yeah. turn your nose up at immediately. It, it, it might as well take a look. It's, you know, but, but this just don't definitely... put it in any headlines. Yeah. That's for me, like... Don't put it in your headline. <laughs> this is a that's now you're getting down a tricky path. Well, this is a perfect example of the correlation does not mean causation. Yes. Just because we find a impact and volcanoes happening near, you know, within a short amount of time of each other, twice in the Mesozoic, does not mean they're connected. Indeed. Yes, they could be. It could also just be a really weird draw of the cards. Yeah. And we talked a bunch about this as well in the the end Cretaceous yes. episode. But there is a third category. <gasps> the other big thing that happened at this time, a more extent, uh, extended process, is sea level change. Hey. There was a major drop in sea level at the end of the Triassic, and then a major rise in sea level in the early Jurassic. Mm-hmm. This was a big change, but it was long over an extended period of time. Interesting. During those big changes, there were also a number of shorter fluctuations, and there is some evidence that finds certain marine organisms, populations changing along with those sea level fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Which makes perfect sense, right? That's a big change. Yes. Uh, Changing sea level is going to shift your nutrient availability. It's going to change what your coastal habitats look like. It's going to change how much right, where the coast is and where the shallow water is is going to change how much sunlight your various organisms are getting. Like, that's a big deal. It's going to rewrite all the currents that you've been, you know, traveling by or feeding off of. So, certainly a, a big effect, but sea level changes happen pretty often. Mm -hmm. These sea level fluctuations are not limited to this boundary. Yes. Right, they, they they occur over a time frame that does not all show evidence of extinctions. Mm-hmm. So much like with the end Cretaceous extinction, this is one of those cases where I don't know that anyone these days is strongly suggesting that this was the cause, but it certainly could have been creating lots of stress yes. on the environment. Which is we you know we've talked about this with. Any time we come up on a situation in the fossil record that has multiple possible answers or debates going on is, you know, there's always a chance that it's all three. You know, we can yep. never assume that it's just going to be once. Maybe the sea levels are changing when some volcanoes came up, and at some point in all of that, a giant rock hit the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and it raises the question of, 
if all of these things were related, is one of them the main thing? Mm-hmm. Is one of them... Did one of them not matter at all? Did, you know, how did they interact? And this is an, extra, an even more interesting case compared to something like the end Cretaceous, because in this case, we're, we don't even know how they all line up yet. Yeah, exactly. Like, we don't know the order, which yep. is half of what can give you the answer sometimes. Yeah, we've got all these things happened at about the same time. Mm-hmm. So what we know about the end Triassic extinction is lots of things went extinct over at, at most several million years. Lots of environmental shifts seem to have happened, and there were a few really big deal things going on Mm -hmm. that could very easily have been creating lots of stress on the environment, changes to the atmosphere, changes to the oceans, changes to habitat distribution, and as is always the case, large-scale, fast change is bad for life. Yep. Life needs to adapt, and adaptation is partially luck of the draw, mm-hmm. and takes time. It takes uh, That's the biggest thing, is it's not something that can happen on no. uh, instantly. It needs time for the processes to take place. Yes, and if, if a change happens too fast, right? Once again, going back to that lizard mm-hmm. news piece, which I did not realize when I chose it, how apt it would be yeah. to compare to this event. You know, because I, I said, well, change doesn't happen fast, and then I thought back to that, well, that, that lizards evolved big heads in, like, 15 years. Mm-hmm. Which is true, but the other four lizards went extinct. Yes, exactly. Like, that <laughs> so, was in response to a mass <laughs> extinction on their islands. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Rapid change, bad. Lots of potentially catastrophic shifts, even if they were long-term catastrophic shifts. Well, the way I love to think about uh, extinction events, especially the the big five and mass ones like that, and even things like the Cambrian Explosion, is I I often think about it as when something goes wrong with your uh, car, which yes. is personally very topical <laughs> with the, the recent year I've had with my automobiles. Um, <laughs> but... When when a car breaks down, it's one of those things where, like, if it's an older car, well, there's wear and tear. Right. If you, like, hit a curb yesterday, that can always do something. And then if you have to take a long trip for to, like, visit family, mm-hmm. and your car breaks down somewhere on that trip, well, was it the age, the bump, or the trip that killed it? Yeah. Yeah. It, a little bit of all of them. Maybe one of them. You know, it's, had you avoided one of those, it might have been fine, or it might not have been. You but it's really hard to put the the pin on exactly why an yep. event happened without you having literally all the information. And well, that's it's the same thing with medical diagnosis. Exactly, yeah. Right? What have you eaten? Where have you been? What's your family history like? Uh, y- yesterday, last night, uh, our dog mm-hmm. started acting super weird and acting like she was really uncomfortable and in pain. And she was like, shaking and and she didn't want to walk things like that and we were you know trying to figure out what was wrong and it you know did did you get hurt Mm -hmm. what have you done recently did we you know we just started you on new food is do you not like the food what part of your body hurts yeah because you can't tell us that and it's this like you know you you're trying to figure out all the the dog is fine by the way yes uh what happened is she probably like threw her back out because she's a tiny little dog and Tiny little dogs tend to have back problems. And she moves around uh, a She's lot. okay. She's <laughs> drugged up. She's having a great day. <laughs> she's, having, <laughs> she's having the best of days. Yeah, she's, she's doing great. She got, she got lots of love and lots of attention and medicine. And then today, she's doing fine until she remembers that she's supposed to be sick. And she goes and curls up again. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, give me attention. Um, but yeah, so it's, yeah, those, very, those are good analogies. So this is a bit of a tangent before we wrap things up, but this, th- what we're talking about here, this is why they brought Malcolm to the island in Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> is cause yeah, kind of. You're getting into chaos theory where when a system gets to a certain level of complexity, 
it's really hard to pinpoint down all of the causes and machinations and to predict stuff. Mm-hmm. And natural systems are about as complex as they get because there's so many variabilities. Like when you're making yeah. the medical analogies, like, you know, your leg hurts. Well, did you hit it? Also, how is your blood flow in that leg? Like if you had yep. better circulation, you might not be in pain. Or, yeah. you know, do you have a weak hip from some other injury you already had? <laughs> oh, well, then that, you know, would affect it as well. It's, it's, there's so many, was it cold that day? Did you get hit while it was cold? <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, Were you it's, stressed? Exactly. Like all of these different things. And that's, you know, why they brought a, a ki titian <laughs> ki titian onto K-I-tition, the island. actually. Uh, onto the island. I thought he was a rock star. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And this is where we cut ourselves off before. Yeah, no, we're just, just going to devolve into us quoting the movie. Uh, uh, two hours and six minutes <laughs> of Jurassic Park quotes. Only like 16 minutes of it. 16 minutes of it actually has dinosaurs in it. Uh, <laughs> di- dinosaurs? D- d- uh, you gotta dig up dinosaurs. So there's your Triassic, Jurassic extinction event. Hope everybody learned some stuff. Hope everybody enjoyed mm-hmm. it. If you have questions, follow-up questions, follow-up uh, queries, follow-up suggestions, let us know. Big thanks to Thomas and Mark for making this suggestion on Twitter. Yes, thank we, you, because this is a, a a cool event that doesn't often get much attention. This is true. And indeed, I think, if I remember right, that's what I think Thomas said that. Mm-hmm. He was like, I'd love to hear more about this extinction because I don't know much about it. Yeah. Uh, and I and I thought me neither. Uh, <laughs> hey, now I know plenty. You know what we have in common? Yes. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> I got better. And now, so can our listeners? <laughs> now we all know the same amount of stuff. <laughs> now you can be as good as David is. You can be as as cool and as smart and as knowledgeable as me. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be able to match my humility. <laughs> I'm just too humble. I'm the I'm the most humble. I am. I, I have people tell me. Uh, people tell me <laughs> that I am super humble. I was gonna say other stuff. So we <laughs> take suggestions. We love taking your requests. This was an awesome request because mm-hmm. it is one that we would not probably have done anytime soon. If it had gotten requested, I personally would have gone with the Permian extinction. If we were gonna do another extinction event, absolutely. If that you want to hear about other extinction events from the past, let us know. If you want to hear about any other topic in paleontology, evolution, earth history, let us know, ask us questions, leave us requests, suggestions, comments, concerns, find us on social media. Uh, if you are so inclined, we would love to keep doing this forever and ever. Uh, so if you want, come join us on Patreon. Mm-hmm. As is always the case, we release episodes every fortnight. Yark. Keep an eye out in two weeks for the next episode. Thank you for joining us. I'm David, that's Will, Will. and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Doodles. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time.